Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, this session on uh, comparing international youth justice. I think I was chosen to chair this because I'm um, Dusty Kennedy. I'm the director of YJB Cymru in Wales, so I think I was chosen to add an extra international dimension. Um, so I'm not going to hang about. We are starting a little bit late, so I'm going to hand over straight away to Gerhard Buch. Is that close enough? That's close yeah. enough. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he's going to talk to us about the uh, youth justice system in Norway. So we can carry on. I'll give you a shout about 20 minutes. Could I have the remote, please? Uh, I suppose there is a remote. And it's up like this. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is, uh, I'll, I'll just pronounce it the right way, Gerhard Ploeg. It's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, not a Norwegian name, it's a Dutch name. I'm actually Dutch, uh, but I live and work in Norway. I got hooked up with a, a very nice Norwegian girl, and that's how I ended up there. Um, I'm going to be quick, uh, especially in the beginning, with what I'm going to have to say. Um, Dealing with young offenders in Norwegian corrections is going to be the subject of uh, what I'm going to be talking about. Um, here they go. And just very quickly, some relevant character. Sorry, you can't hear me. Oh, all right. How about now? Do do I need to? I can't stand like this all the time. It's <laughs> <laughs> I'm too old for that. My back will give in. Um, maybe I could use that hand hand microphone then would be easier. Is this okay? No? no? Not working? Okay. I'll just I'll just try and talk into the microphone now. There. <laughs> it's not really it helping here. Okay. Um, some relevant characteristics for Norway. I mean relevant for uh, our work in corrections. Uh, we have a welfare-based society. Uh, one third of our workforce is working in civil service. This is uh, quite an interesting and quite uh, uh, an uh, essential feature of our society. Um, we have a weird, bizarre geography. Uh, as you can see, two and a half thousand kilometers from north to south, and at some point here, it's only six kilometers between the sea and Sweden. So, uh, and, and in, in addition, in addition, that one, yeah. There is a very low population density, uh, 15 per square kilometers, while uh, I don't know what that is in miles. You, uh, <laughs> you're weird. Uh, 266 per square kilometer in, uh, in the UK. So that means that we need very many small prisons in our system, spread over, out over the country. Uh, also very important, we are, uh, we are, I, I think the expression was, uh, Harry Anfield was um, considerably richer than Yao. <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> our uh, per capita GDP is 68,400, yours is 42,400. But this is essential for the way we can, we can actually administer our correctional services. Okay, that's about the background. Um, crime development, it's uh, probably the same in uh, many of the other Western European countries. It's going down. Crime is going down. Registered crime is going down. It doesn't mean that crime in itself is going down, but sorry, there I am already. There. Um, <laughs> just so enthusiastic. And, uh, uh, almost 30% since uh, 2001 uh, decrease in the number of offenses reported to the police. And this is, of course, what has consequences for what comes to court and what becomes uh, a sentence, a prison sentence, or a community sentence. My organization, we are, uh, I work here, Director of Correctional Service. We are be, uh, below the Ministry of Justice. We have five regional offices and then prisons and probation offices. And at these three levels, prison and probation uh, is combined. So it's only at the executive level that uh, we have separate units. What kind of units? 44 units at 64 locations for prisons. Uh, we have 15 probation officers at 30 locations. Uh, our complete prison capacity is about 3,800. Uh, as you can see, 2,400 high security and 1,400 low security, lower security. Our largest prison is huge. It's in Oslo. It's 392 cells. It's by far the biggest that we have. The smallest one is 12, and the average is about 60 cells for prisons in Norway. Okay. 
We have no separate remand centers, also important. The central principles, I feel like I'm rushing through this here. <laughs> the central principles in Norwegian corrections, uh, the most important one is the principle of normality. It, it implies that when you are being sentenced to uh, prison, then, or a community sentence for that sake, for that uh, matter, um, you are being uh, taken, what is taken from you is your freedom to move, but all other rights are in place. So you have all the rights of a Norwegian citizen, of a Norwegian inhabitant, as long as you're in prison, apart from the fact that you can't move around the way you want to. It means, for example, that our prisoners have the right to vote and the right to be elected. Um, there's a, we work with import of services. That means that we do not have our own staff dealing with education or medical services or employment services or stuff such we import them from outside we have collaboration with the institutions the social institutions outside the prison which has as one example that there is a better continuity after release and another uh, another advantage is that it uh, gives more insight for the people outside prison as to what is actually inside and who our prisoners are that our prisoners maybe are not so very much different from the people who are not in prison it, it creates a more uh, I think it, it what it does is that it makes Norwegian prisons more of a social institution than in many other countries. Um, in addition, we, are, so we want to reduce the use of prison as much as possible. We have very broad administrative authority in the correctional services. That means that uh, we can decide on, uh, for example, early release. We can decide on whether someone can serve a sentence on electronic monitoring. We can decide whether they can serve their sentence in a treatment institution. We can decide what the contents are in a community sentence. I'll get back to that later on. Uh, in addition, I think a big advantage for us is that we have a prison officer training of two years. Uh, it is about to be uh, expanded to three years and will, uh, in a couple of years, lead up to a bachelor degree. So when you're a prison officer, you have a bachelor degree. We have a policy of no overcrowding. One in, one out. And this has led for many years to a waiting list for the prison. It means you're being sentenced, and we tell you you can go home, and we'll send you a letter when we have a room available. Uh, it's the only way to deal with overcrowding, unless you want to build and build and build and build and build. So, uh, of course, this is not a very desirable situation, because you, you punish the offender twice, really, because he can't plan any activities, he can't plan any holidays, he has to tell his employer, um, I don't know if I can start this project because I might be receiving a letter in a couple of days. You never know when, you, uh, when you're being called in. So we worked on that. Uh, the waiting list is now gone. Uh, and that is because, maybe some of you heard about this, we rent a prison in the Netherlands. We, uh, <laughs> we, have, we have the money, so we just we took, got in touch with them and said, you have... Uh, we hear that you are closing prisons. Could we please rent some of it? And, uh, and that was okay. So we, suddenly we had 242 extra cells, and now our waiting list is gone. So that's really good. <laughs> About the definition of, it's funny, isn't it? But it, for us, it's just so normal. You know? <laughs> uh, definition of juvenile offenders. For what I will be talking about, I'll be talking about uh, juvenile offenders in the correctional service. That means that they are over 15 because that is our age of criminal responsibility, 15. Uh, and uh, it means that they are then between 15 and 17 years old. They serve uh, sentences in the community and they serve them in prison. I have some graphs here that I will go quickly through. Uh, sanctions for juveniles 15 to 17 years old. What you see here is a strong decrease in the number of sanctions for that age category over the last, uh, let's say, the last 10 years. Much more than for the group who are older than 17. It has something to do also with the share of 15 to 17 year olds. So of all the imposed sanctions, you see that the 15 to 17 year olds, 17 years old, have uh, decreased from 3% to 1.5%. It's not very, they're not very large numbers, but it's uh, a 50% uh, reduce, reduction. 53% actually. There you go. Um, what kind of sanctions do they receive? Um, this is for 2015. Uh, conditional waiver, 
fines. Fines are the largest, uh, largest part of it, then conditional waiver, and then we have uh, conditional prison, community sentence, unconditional prison, and other types of sentences. And you're reading it right, there are 23 uh, unconditional prison sentences in uh, 2015, which, as we will see, are not all executed in the prison. Uh, as far as the community sentence is concerned, also there we see a sharp decrease. decrease. This is uh, consistent with the decrease in juvenile delinquency that we see almost over all of Western Europe. Uh, I noticed that there was an, there was an article uh, uh, some time ago about that the same thing is happening here in, uh, in England and Wales as well. Um, I don't really know what it's, what it is, what it's about. Um, there are several explanations that you can come up with, but they probably are not. Uh, a topic here. Personally, I believe that it might have something to do with the fact that uh, kids don't hang around on street corners anymore, but they hang around on Snapchat and, uh, and Instagram and uh, maybe do other types of crimes that we don't really have a hold on yet. But there may be many, many different explanations for it. Police priorities, for example. Okay. Um, the community sentence, what is it? Uh, legal framework, 30 to 30, 420 hours to be completed in uh, maximum one and a half years. And the contents is decided by the correctional service. Uh, the contents consists of either community service or community service and other preventive measures. Uh, we have about 10% breach. And in the case of a breach, the correctional service uh, acts as prosecuting party. So it doesn't go to the public prosecutor, but we go to court and ask the court for, uh, for a transformation to, uh, to a prison sentence. This is for, for uh, all age categories, of course, not just for juveniles. There's uh, about 20% recidivism uh, among those who uh, do a community sentence. And it's about the same uh, among prisoners, by the way. Community service, so the unpaid work part, 65% of all hours. Uh, it consists of unpaid work, non-profit organizations, consent is required from the, uh, from the offender uh, supervision at the workplace, and we try to find places for them to work which has, have the highest value as to rehabilitative uh, functioning. How am I doing for time? Yeah, half. half, all right, okay. The other contents of a community sentence, um, <coughs> there's one obligatory element in it, and that's uh, conversations focused on crime prevention, on how can you, pre uh, how can you try to avoid new offenses in the future. Uh, these, have to be, uh, th these have to be a part of the, of the sentence. Otherwise, uh, you have assessment. The assessment itself is part of the community sentence, so part of the hours. Uh, treatment can be part of it, uh, various skills, uh, development, uh, adult education or education uh, for, for minors. Um, educational groups and training life skills. Uh, behavioral programs, mediation, and actually everything that the probation service thinks uh, is, can be functional in preventing future offending, um, as long as the offender agrees with it. So that's 35% of the community sentence hours in the course of a year. Other sanctions in the community, we have uh, electronic monitoring. As I said before, this is decided by the, by the correctional service after an application from the offender or from the, from the sentence person. Uh, over 18, uh, you have to have a sentence up to four months or the last four months of a longer prison sentence. This is going to be expanded to six months within uh, a couple of, uh, couple of weeks. Uh, for under 18, you can also have electronic monitoring and there are no limitations. So no matter what length of sentence you have, you can have it transformed into electronic monitoring. Um, as to this here, by the way, uh, this has not happened. We have not had any electronic monitoring under 18 years old as yet, and we've had electronic monitoring since 2008. It's never happened yet, because 15 to 17 year olds very seldom get sentenced to prison, so there's very, very seldom an opportunity to apply for electronic monitoring. There are two relatively new sanctions for juveniles, youth punishment and youth follow-up. I didn't translate this, uh, I just take it from the official documents. Youth punishment is maybe not really what I would call it. But mm -hmm. This is based on the fact that a white paper was published by the government uh, in 2008 where the main goals were 
to reduce the number of minors in prison. This has been a goal for the government from 2005. We've had a Minister of Justice from 2005 to 2013 who was very clear on the fact that he did not want any children under 18 in prison. And we have seen the effects of that. Uh, for those who nevertheless will have to go to prison because they've committed really serious crimes, we have uh, established juvenile units. Uh, and there are new penal sanctions outside the prison system. Those are the, the uh, youth punishment and the youth follow-up. Uh, youth punishment is an alternative to prison and longer community sentences. Uh, it's a court decision. The target group, as you can see here, young offenders who have committed severe or repeated crimes and the, actually the only difference between this one and this one, no, there are two differences, is that this one also can be uh, imposed by a prosecutor, but the length of the youth punishment is much more than the length of the youth follow-up. They are, as far as contents of these sanctions are concerned, sorry, sorry, I have to say something else first. These sanctions are administered by the National Mediation Service. Uh, it's the only type of sanction, of uh, court sanction or prosecutor sanction in Norway that is not administered by the correctional services. Five minutes, yes, I'll make that. I'll make it. Come on, make it. Here, you see, the mediation services, they are directly under the Department of Civil Affairs at the Ministry of Justice. Uh, <coughs> there are 22 of them of these offices working with about 650 local uh, mediators. Uh, what does it consist of? Both youth punishment and youth uh, uh, follow-up have the same structure based on uh, actually on principles of restorative justice. Um, a youth conference with a restorative character, an agreed upon action plan and fulfillment of the action plan. A follow-up team is composed for each individual offender uh, consisting of teacher, coach, child welfare worker, health worker, police, and in all cases also someone from the probation service. Yes, that's the one that we saw just now. There. Uh, how is it being used? It was introduced in, uh, in uh, July 2014, and since that time we've had 119 youth punishment sentences and 843 youth follow-up. These are the numbers for 2017 until July, which means that it's not really taking off, but there is a stable influx of, uh, of sentences in this field. Uh, most common offenses are violent and drug offenses. So, then we have prison. Um, these are the number of new admissions to prison in the course of a year. Uh, as you can see here, the blue ones are sentences and the red are remand. There are a number of people under, under 18 in remand, uh, but the number of sentences, as you can see here from 2010 on, has been 15 total. So 15 prison sentences for youngsters under 18. Come on. There. We have two juvenile units. units. <laughs> Um, these, be, these were established uh, because we had to uh, stick to the uh, UN um, Declaration on the, on the Rights of the Child, which says that oh. children shall not, shall not be uh, together in prison with adults. So we established these two units. Uh, one is near Bergen and one is near Oslo. Those are the two metropoles in Norway. Uh, both have a capacity of four. <coughs> I knew that. Yeah. Who are the children who are in prison right now? Uh, this is for June 2017, all under 18. There were six males, so this is including the ones who are on remand. Six males, one female, two 16-year-olds, five 17-year-olds, four were Norwegians and three were foreign nationals. Five are on remand, two are sentenced. Uh, one is in regular prison, uh, in addition to, uh, to the ones that are in, uh, in, the, in the units. Uh, six in the juvenile units, and they have committed very serious crimes. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't have been sent to prison. It's murder, rape, arson, robbery, what have you. Um, an evaluation report from 2015, uh, looking at the characteristics of this group of, uh, of uh, children, says um, there are comprehensive, complex problems and needs for help. Uh, they have very often previously been placed in protective units before they came to prison. 
They have long-standing family drugs, school, mental health problems, all types of problems. Uh, this is not un uncommon, of course. This is, this is the same for, uh, for juvenile, serious juvenile delinquents all over the world, I think. Violent and threatening behavior. So you get the eternal uh, correctional dilemma between uh, security and rehabilitation, you might say, and in this case, normality, uh, as I call it, as, after the principle of normality that we try to uh, use in Norway. There is continuous CCTV monitoring in the shared areas. Uh, rooms are monitored visually through hatches and uh, after entry, so in your first stage in, your, in the prison, uh, we come and check you every 15 minutes uh, when you're awake and every half hour when you are asleep. I'm not going to make one minute, but I don't care. <laughs> I do. <Yeah. laughs> There's no internet and phone. This might be quite logical, but I'm putting it here anyway because I have the idea that, especially the last five years, it has become much tougher to serve a sentence in prison, also for adults, because, the, because of the loss of contact with social media and with the information uh, community that we all access so easily so often. I recently asked my 13-year-old uh, my son uh, if he would prefer to go a week to prison with his telephone or stay a week at home without his telephone, and he chose prison. <laughs> now, they are twins, and my other son, uh, he, uh, he chose home. So, it, just to say that this is not because we have a, a very nasty home or something. <laughs> Uh, there are common meals, activity, there's uh, football, climbing, etc., uh, etc. Et All this has to be, uh, of course, um, reconciliated with each other, combined with each other. And that's the dilemma that you always work with and that makes our, uh, our work so fascinating, I think. I'm almost through. Staff, at, this is for the Unit West. There's an assistant prison governor, uh, because it's, it's an, a department of a larger prison. Uh, at a completely other place, by the way. Uh, and there's a first officer, then there's a staff of 29, 15 of whom are prison officers, uh, with training in working with juveniles, 14 social workers, and there are externals that we import. You may remember that I told you about the import model. Psychologists, childcare workers, school teachers, medical staff, etc. They are all being imported. Um, this is uh, the budget, for, also for Unit West. Uh, about 600,000 pounds per inmate per year. That's a lot of money, but hey. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's about 1,600 pounds per inmate per day. Uh, this is not including the imported services, so not including mental services, uh, health services, mental health services, uh, teachers, etc., etc. The one-to-one -one education that we have in our in our units costs about 500,000 kroners per pupil per year is about 50,000 pounds per year. Um, that's it. I'll leave it to you, and then I can answer questions if you might have some uh, afterwards. I think I did quite well, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much. I'm going to try again. Yeah, that's rubbish. Uh, okay, I'm not going to hang about again. I'm going to hand over to Claire, who's going to go and talk to us about Scotland. So, Claire Lighton. Thank you, um, and a pleasure to talk to you. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah, um, that's all the Glaswegian training I've been having at the, with the karaoke mic. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk quite quickly to hopefully give you a bit of an indication of a range of different things so we can follow up with conversations afterwards. So apologies for the speed, um, but... But um, it's actually quite difficult. There's quite a lot of context to try, try and get in. So in Scotland, you can't talk about youth justice without referencing the Kilbrandon Committee um, that reported in 1964 now. And it's just really interesting that we still continue to do this in Scotland. It very much it set the principles um, and the groundwork, really, for the thinking about how do we approach children that are involved in um, um, offending behaviours. And, and that's going back to the 60s. I'd be interested to hear from you if you've got a similar kind of culture, if there's similar documents that you um, speak to and you re re reflect back on yourselves um, but it, I think it's there's something just worth that there's, this has been um, a kind of guided a principle um, based approach for quite a considerable t amount of time now this is the most recent um, children and, and youth justice strategy so it's called preventing offending getting it right for children and young people 
note the language. Um, it very clearly situates children and young people involved in offending in a broader children's policy. Getting it right for every every, every child is, is a policy that is called called in Scotland. You have the, the, the kind of equivalent um, in, 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 in England and Wales. And it really is about focusing on that individual approach and thinking about what it means to have a good life, it, taking that broad holistic approach. And these children are no different. So that's very much the, the position then of, of our approach to children involved in offending. It's interesting that the, the place in which the youth, there is a youth justice team in the Scottish Government, it sits within the Children and Families Directorate in the Scottish Government. So there's just different kind of positioning for, oh, I'm going backwards, for some, for some of that. So going back to Kilbrandon, what Kilbrandon recommended were lay panels in local authority areas. So the 32 local authorities in Scotland um, and having those local um, and, and citizen involvement in justice um, for, for children and, and young people. They also recommended social education departments which combine children and families social work and education as a focal point for coordination of information. They didn't action that second point of the, the, the recommendation and it's interesting in Scotland at the moment, I don't know if it's reached you, but there's a lot of debate about named person service. Um, having a service where but often that will be the teacher that has um, responsibility for <coughs> coordinating that information. So very similar issues dealt with um, that continue to, to, to be dealt with um, through our, our approach to children involved in offending. What Kilbrandon really did and what the establishment of the children's hearing system did, those lay panels, um, was separate establishing the fact, so what actually happened, from the intervention. So the, the hearing system really focuses on the child and thinking about what's in the child's best interests um, on, on a principle basis. There's different experiences in, in reality um, right enough. So the purpose of Kilbrandon then is, it was, sorry, if public concern must always be for the effective treatment of delinquency, the appropriate treatment measures in any individual case can be decided only on an informed assessment of the individual child's actual needs. This linking of needs and deeds um, is, is how it's often sort of um, um, lip focused down. We talk about needs and deeds a lot in Scotland and the need to, need to balance them. Note as well the, the focus on effectiveness. Um, again, we'll see parallels of that. So it's not necessarily about justice, it's not about rights, it's about effectiveness. This is an effect, effective approach. And, and in Kilbrandon, there was no separation. To be effective was to meet the child's needs. Um, and that was in the society's needs because there was no separation. What was in the child's interest is in society's best interests. Um, it, it changes um, somewhat later, later on in some of, some of the discussion. And there's a lot then about responsibility and punishment. So for Kilbrandon, criminal um, prosecution assumes a high level of personal responsibility and choice. So choosing to do, do wrong merit, merits punishment. For Kilbrandon, children's behaviour is a collective responsibility. So it's the child, it's the family and the state. And the punishment by the state, so that's not to say no punishment, punishment by the family, um, or, or well, well and good, but punishment by the state should be in the best interest of the child. That's the kind of principle to it. So moving to, to the, the modern day and the, the current um, um, children justice strategy, it was published in 2015. It references needs and deeds, so you see this echoing um, and, and very much situating uh, um, uh, around the, chil the, child's, the child's best interest, um, children's policy. But it focuses very much on individual well-being, the child's interest and, and well-being, um, and loses something in doing that. I understand the need for that holistic approach, but it, it doesn't also make as much reference to the family, to the state, to structures, to society, to community. And I've just heard echoes of that so, so far this, in, in this morning. But how do you balance the, the, the two, um, and how, how do you get that balance right? And our sentencing council, the Scottish Sentencing Council, is currently really thinking about a, a guideline for sentencing children and young people. Um, and, and this is just a, a quote that, that highlights, whilst um, the overarching approach to sentencing young people has many elements in common with sentencing other offenders, there's also a key difference in relation to the relative weight put on rehabilitation and punishment as purposes of sentencing, as well as the extent of maturity, that maturity should be taken into consideration and the importance of clear 
clear um, and simple communication. So that's a current, current issue at the moment facing Scotland, as is the minimum age of criminal responsibility. At, at, cur at the current time, it's eight in Scotland, um, but we're expecting legislation <coughs> in February to increase that to 12. Um, but it's really interesting what that's bringing out in, in some of the debates about the provision of the bill, um, about what does it actually mean to not be criminally responsible? What does that look like? What do we do? What do we, how do we talk about it? I'll be interested to hear from your experience. How do we talk about behaviour that would have been criminal, but it's no longer criminal, it's harm, but how do we talk about that and how do we respond? Is it then a child protection issue, but it's not, a, not necessarily abuse and neglect in the home? How do we respond and think about that? There's real challenges, I think, um, going on in, in some of those conversations. In the detail, um, although there's a lot of support, the consultation for um, um, raising the age of criminal responsibility, it was 96% were in favour of raising the age of criminal responsibility. So a lot of broad support, but the detail is, is going to be quite interesting about what it really means not to criminalise children. And we see this, um, the echoes of Kilbrandon in the separation of the establishment of the facts. So power, police powers around searching and interviewing, taking and retaining samples, and the importance of doing that, um, um, as opposed to what should then be done. So issues around disclosure, managing care and risk, and responding um, to children. So the, the, it's just, I think it's just interesting. We. There's a, there's a, throughout that history from 64 to the present day we're still seeking this balance still seeing the, the right approach but the, the system's changed quite fundamentally so when the children's hearing system was set up um, its first year of, of, of full operation in, in 1972 um, the total referrals um, received by the children's history um, hearing system were 20, tw just over 24,000 um, and of that 21,500 uh, yeah, um, were about alleged offences um, by children so the majority of the children's hearing system was focused on children involved in offending if we look more to the modern day these figures are from 2016-17 and the referrals to the children's um, report of the children's hearing system it's 14,000 um, today on non-offence ground and offence ground it's just under 3,000 you've seen a complete reversal of the population being supported then by the children's hearing system that's point one, point two is the reductions that we see, seem to be seeing a pretty similar um, pattern across a range of different jur jurisdictions so the, um, I'll just point them to you so the blue line is offence referrals to SCRA, that means the Scottish Children's Reporters Administration, the kind of key contact point for the hearing system. Um, the green line is 12 to 18 year olds prosecuted in adult courts, um, which is down 78%, and the red is under 18s in custody, which is 77%. So we've seen reductions of between 77 to 82% across that range of different contacts with, with, with the justice system. But that tells you that we've stopped having that system contact. It doesn't tell you about the behaviour under, underlying it, which, which has been alluded to um, already. Some of this has been achieved by the establishment of a different process. So there's a system called Early and Effective Intervention in Scotland, which at its heart is a multi-agency meeting. It's usually chaired by the police, and it brings together social work, a range of different agencies, and they meet and talk about low-level offending by um, a, a child and young person before it goes to the children's hearing system. So it's a pre-hearing system kind of intervention. And it can, do, it can decide to do nothing, which is a very difficult decision for people to take actually but it can decide to do nothing it can decide to refer to a third sector agency um, one of the agencies involved in that meeting can um, choose to support the child so there's a range of different options but it means that these children don't get go, don't go basically aren't, aren't seen through it through this system and we've seen re reductions in, in the number of young people in custody, um, significant changes for under 21s and um, under 18 year olds in Scotland and it's interesting, the remand population, which again, I think, I think there are sort of many similarities ac across the different um, systems. So the um, green line is the total number of under 18s and the blue is the re remand population. So at some points our remand population um, um, is higher than our convicted population and there's 41 children um, in custody in Scotland um, this week. And we know it's not successful, in short. I won't go into all the details, but the, um, the, um, 
the, uh, around 60% of children who le leave custody are reconvicted a year after uh, le leaving custody. Um, there's some indications that that might, might be um, getting worse because I, I imagine because of the, the needs of that population have become more, more and more complex. And some of the broader issues we're having in, in, in society around reductions of opportunities and, and reductions of services. I like this because I think we sometimes forget it, but some really important research from um, the University of Edinburgh, the Edinburgh Study of Youth Transition and Crime, which surveyed um, over 4,000 children in, in it's that in secondary school in, 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 in Edinburgh. And they found that 95% of them offend at some lower level during their childhood. And I think, if you're honest, <laughs> I think many, many of you would, would concur with that. And I think it's just a really helpful message that we, we think about as we talk about children who are involved in offend, offending behaviour. What are we trying to prevent? What offending are we talking about? And, and, and um, how, how do we treat others? And how do we label um, and encourage those labels? I wanted to share this because this is from the justice strategy, not the children's justice strategy, the justice, adult justice strategy in Scotland has a double page spread about adverse childhood experiences. There is an increasing recognition um, across the policy and practice community across Scotland of the significance of adverse childhood experience. So they are the abuse, the neglect, the household dysfunction that children experience that has an impact on their childhood, it has an impact on their health, um, and it has an in impact on the, a range of outcomes. So those who have experienced four or more adverse um, childhood experiences, so each one is horrific, um, but if you've experienced four or more, there's um, a, an incremental effect uh, around that adversity. So for those who've experienced four or more, you're 15 times more likely to have committed violence against another person in the past year, 16 times more likely to have used crack um, cocaine or heroin, and you're 20 times more likely to have been incarcerated at some point in your life compared to those who've experienced none. And there's a growing evidence base around this. Um, the the grey line here is um, um, a service called Ivy, so it supports children that are involved in a very serious level of offending um, in Scotland. And this is com the blue is compared to the general population in England and Wales. We don't have a, a survey in, in Scotland itself, but we think it, it, the, 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 you know, it's, it's broadly comparable. Um, and so you can just see that each one is higher, with particularly high levels around parental separation and domestic violence and broader issues about loss um, and, and breakdown of, of relationships and that's similar around we've heard it referenced already the, the looked after um, um, population so three quarters of young people um, were not living with their biological parents that were referred to the, at the Ivy service um, for, for children involved in very high level of offending um, and similar in terms of, of children in Pullman Young Offenders Institution and, and so on so there's really strong evidence base around a broader loss, um, a loss of relationships. And this is work around bereavement. So um, we did work about um, experience of bereavement in, in Pullman Young Offenders Institution. 67% of the, the young men there had experienced um, four or more bereavements. So these are, are young men. 77% had experienced traumatic bereavements in their close family or friends. So murder, drug overdose, <coughs> and, and suicide. Um, and it's not just that they've experienced that, I, I, I'm conscious that that's quite a blunt stat, we're often finding the bodies and dealing with that as well. So, so Pullman Young Offenders Institution has done quite a lot around that. Now, all that work about um, adverse childhood experiences I've just referenced, it doesn't um, count bereavement, it doesn't count bullying, it doesn't um, reference speech, language and communication needs, school exclusion, which um, is around 80% for the uh, population in our Young Offenders Institution in Scotland, and undiagnosed learning difficulties. So it's a really good start in thinking about the complexities but it's, it's not yet the full, the full picture and I think this is really important because I've been part of some quite concerning um, actually conversations about can we just find all these children with adversity and then do something to treat them well no you can't um, as, as well as the ethical problems there's a huge proportion the large proportion of our population of children that experience trauma and adversity of some type um, 
for, and a very small proportion of those on, go on to seriously offend, by which I mean we accept that all of us do at some point. So a serious offend in terms of a pattern of offending or, or offending at that most serious level. Um, the majority don't go on to, to be involved in that pattern. However, when you look at children who are involved at offending at that more serious level, they've nearly all experienced trauma, adversity, um, and neglect and abuse. And very, very quickly, I just wanted to talk um, a little bit, that's a bit about the po policy and a bit of the population in, in Scotland. I just want to talk about some of the practice. It's really striking coming here and seeing all the references to youth justice. I'm using the term myself. I'm from the Centre for Youth Justice. We're about the only thing called youth justice in Scotland. Um, it's a, 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 a much um, broader range of people and professions that are involved in supporting children and young people involved in offending, with a lot of this work being led by social work children and families social work um, but increasingly often also criminal justice social work which is, is um, definitely an issue for us to think about so um, in, back in 2007 um, all local authorities across Scotland had a, a youth justice team it's now about 30% of our uh, 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 um, local authorities in Scotland that have that. And there's something in that because part of it is in the recognition of the range of adversities, the range of um, things we need to do to prevent <coughs> offending um, for children. But some of it is also potentially a workforce being lost around that really specialist holding the vulnerability, the trauma and the offending and the risk. Um, so there's, there's definitely a challenge for us there. One thing that we've really been focusing is on the whole system approach. That's how it's talked about in, um, in Scotland, which is about early and effective intervention, I've mentioned, but also broader opportunities to ma maximise diversion. And that's where a lot of our debate and a lot of our discussion is now centred on. And one of the key themes, so there's three, three um, priorities for the children's justice strategy, and one of them is improving life chances, and that's then got a, an infrastructure around it to support that, which gives a strategic focus on school ex um, inclusion, strengthening relationships and engagement, victims and community confidence, health and well-being, transition, opportunities for all employability so there's a much broader focus on how on prevention um, and a prevention at an ever earlier um, stage and so where are we going I think it's um, I, I think it's hard to hard to call it there's a lot going on around societal shifts around um, substance taking changes around online behaviors um, there's been an increase in sex offending um, amongst young people in Scotland and an expert group has just been established um, to, to have a look at that in greater depth um, and there's both I think a broader net widening happening around some, how we are dealing with children and their internet behaviour but there's also a specific problem of increasingly very concerning behaviour amongst young people. Um, there's indications of the need to strengthen some of our early and effective intervention processes. I mentioned some of the workforce challenges um, that that's ha um, posing. We're also looking at the children's hearing system and should we make the presumption that all under 18 year olds go through the chil children's hearing system rather than the courts? What would that need and, and what would that um, bring? greater fo focus on diversion from prosecution. I think like most places, it's very patchy in Scotland around what's available um, and, and what's on offer. There's really interesting, I mentioned the age of criminal responsibility. I think there's really interesting indications of broader um, attitudinal or workforce changes that might come um, along with that. And then there's discussions similar to, to what I've heard echoed here around why stop at 18, particularly given the, the support to care experience young people up to 20, 25. So I think we're, we're, we're looking at some of, some of these issues. What we've not got, what, which is really interesting reflecting um, and looking at the situation of Wales, we don't mention rights. In, in, despite the children's focus, rights gets really minimal reference and neither does justice in terms of what does a just society mean and, and, and what's the, the, the role of the youth justice system in that. Um, but it is interesting to, to see the Welsh um, um, strategy to really, really prioritise rights. I think that's where it's going in Scotland, but I think we're further behind around some of that. There's also unfinished business around restorative justice um, and, and community justice, which I've referenced, which is coming next. Whether we're going to respond to the underlying need that underpins a lot of the offending, I think we're, we're in difficult and challenging times. 
But one of the really interesting things that's happened in Scotland has been the establishment of a care review um, for care experienced young, young, young people, for and by care experienced young people. This is Nicola Sturgeon, so it's blurry. Nicola Sturgeon talking to a, a group of care experienced young people. And um, care experienced young people are really being brought in um, in ways that I've not seen before, in really meaningful ways, to design what this is going to look like and make recommendations around that. And I think by the process of that, it's already started a change whereby it's almost unthinkable that you develop policy and practice without really involving care experienced young people. I, can th I think that we've got a lot more to do for children that are accused um, and, and children that are involved in offending around broader empowerment in and inclusion. But I think we're on a bit of a journey around how to do that better in Scotland, which I think is, is quite exciting. Um, and I just wanted to finish uh, with a little bit about us and the centre because it's just interesting our model and that we exist. So we're funded, Centre for Youth and Criminal Justice is funded by the Scottish Government and we try and sit, so we're hosted in a university and we try and sit between, we're funded by policy, primarily the team of social workers and psychologists so from a practice background and we exist to support practice. Um, we're in a research institution, we have a small research team and our goal is to try and bring the knowledges from pro policy, practice, research and lived experience together to design a better system for us all. So <coughs> I thought it might just be useful for you to know that. Um, please do get in touch if that's of interest. Thank you. Thanks very much, Claire, and Jochen Vau for the plug of our strategy. Thanks very much. Uh, so finally, uh, before we go over to questions, I'm going to hand over to Lucy Dawes, International Youth Justice Consultant. So over to Lucy. Thank you. Okay. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I used to be at the Youth Justice Board. Um, I was the Director of Operations with responsibility for the community side and then towards the end of my time there also secure. Um, in the two and a half years since I left, I've had the privilege of um, working uh, internationally in places very different from the two you've just described. If uh, you've just heard described, if I say that most of my work has been funded by UNICEF, um, uh, you'll understand that these are some of the poorest places, um, places with no youth justice system um, that you can imagine. I'm not going to name where I've been working because some of what I'm going to say is a little critical um, and we're being filmed. Uh, so um, if you want to uh, hear more, find me in the bar. Um, uh, so um, so uh, I started this with this, you know, you can imagine, can't you? You're asked, you know, would you go and help someone set up a youth justice system? And you think, oh, this is going to be brilliant. I can take some of, you know, Scotland's child panels and a bit of New Zealand family uh, conferencing and some Northern Ireland restorative justice. And you can create this wonderful system. And then you have to get over yourself and realize that actually you're going to some really, really poor places and some very tiny places. Um, the smallest place I've worked in is 30,000 people trying to run a whole country. Um, uh, they are very small and geographically spread places. Um, everyone knows everyone. I realized the barmaid in one of the hotels I was staying in was the mother of um, one of the most serious offenders who I'd um, been talking about only that afternoon. Uh, so these are places where people, everybody knows everybody. Um, there is uh, real issues around confidentiality um, and um, uh, kind of how do you uh, respect a child's privacy and allow a child to um, rehabilitate themselves when everyone knows who they are and what they did. Um, you also discover you have no trained staff. There may be people who were referred to as social workers, but when you actually dig a little deeper, nobody has a qualification. The people who are social workers um, do everything from approving people's welfare payments to dealing with the elderly, the disabled, fostering adoption, um, and occasionally one once in a blue moon, a bit of youth justice. So um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very different context. Um, those people who know me know that I love a bit of data um, and I love to be able to analyze trends and what's happening and yeah. First place I worked and I asked for the data, yeah. I was handed four sheets of A4, um, and I thought this was probably a week's offending in a London borough. No, this was five years worth of youth justice offending. Um, the names are in quite big print. They gave me the names, date of birth, offences, and what's happened to them, yeah. um, uh, which is how I discovered about the barmaid. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, the, the data isn't there. You can't analyze trends. Yeah? 
you know, you can have you could have four offences one year, and that will be a hundred percent increase on the previous year. Yeah. So um, it's 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 very very hard to kind of predict what you're going to um, be dealing with and what type of provision you need to have. And remember, you've got a workforce that does everything. Yeah. So trying to think about a system that would cope that is um is very um, challenging. Yeah. Um, there's also uh, somewhat of a reliance on very old legislation and a lot of this before we all feel too righteous about it is our legislation that we left behind there seems to be a a, um, a real um, liking of the 1935 act that we passed um, which allows for corporal punishment of children um, uh, which is still on the statute books in a lot of countries um, and it's not their fault it's our fault we didn't enact some of our legislation to be relevant to them um, and so you, know, you start off feeling a bit, you know, you mean you've still got corporate punishment on the books and then you think, oh shit, it's actually our fault. But, um, uh, so, yeah, um, so, and capital punishment is still on some of the books, although not used. Um, and corporate punishment, I'm told, is rarely used, which to me means it is used. Um, uh, so um, uh, schools can exclude children at the drop of a hat um, uh, if, they, if they don't feel the child um, is behaving. Um, and there's also these things called status offences in, in United Nations speak. These are offences that you could only be convicted of because of your status as a child. Yeah? So this is truancy, running away from home, failing to follow um, uh, school rules, and have your parent declare you unruly, um, which I've seen <coughs> happen in court, and before we feel too righteous about it, we used to do it too. Um, uh, so um, uh, it is um, an interesting process to watch. Um, uh, so, and children will be in prison for it. Um, there's a mixture within their secure establishments of children who are there for protection and children who are there because they've committed an offence. Now, this is a blurring that is sometimes done in the child's best interests. I have met some amazing judges um, in these uh, circumstances who are without the right legislation, without the right institutions, trying desperately hard not to criminalise children and not to sentence children to custody. So they sentence them under child protection. Unfortunately, that means a child is sentenced to two years imprisonment under child protection, which is it's like um, it takes some getting your head round. Um, the other thing you find is that uh, the people with the money at the moment are the Americans, um, although maybe not anymore since nice man came in um, uh, and a lot of the children's provision has been built with US aid now this is a to me a bit of a kind of America is the only country in the world now not signed up to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child yeah? um, uh, but they provide money to very poor countries to build child provision and to write the um, operating manuals for these establishments I have in the last two and a half years recommended that two of them be knocked down um, and be rebuilt because they are the worst you can think of uh, as an adult prison they would be dire um, so rows of cells facing each other with doors that are bars not not solid doors um, girls and boys in the same block um, uh, you don't go there on ligature points, on you know, um, uh, on security, on everything. It's um, it's it's difficult, and and it's not the fault of the people who are trying to run these establishments, who are trying to do their absolute utmost to run, uh, you know, a good establishment. It's that they've been given a model that's been built, and then they're left. They've got no money of their own to make it any better. Yeah. So, um, uh, I think that was all. Oh, trauma and abuse. We've just heard that being talked about. So, um, statistic for one of the regions I've been working is that one in three girls and one in six boys have been sexually abused, um, and that is probably an underestimate. Um, uh, this is, uh, so the trauma, and remember these are also children that everyone knows, yeah? So everyone knows who the perpetrators were, but no one seems to do anything about the perpetrators, which is sort of a bit of a conundrum that I've been trying to kind of help them with. Um, uh, so, um, it, it, yep. It's, uh, it's, it's scary stuff. Most of the children, well, all the children in the secure establishments that I've been in have been abused. Um, and uh, if they were in Norwegian model or anywhere else, they wouldn't be there. Yeah? They would be in a therapeutic community, but there is none. Um, the, the best that 
can happen is that they get exported somewhere where there is that. So Canada takes some children. Um, uh, we used to. We now want to be paid to do it, and no one has any money. Um, so um, that's become a bit of a problem. And um, if there are family mem members in other parts of the world that can provide some support and some money, or there's a charity that will support, judges will often make decisions to export the children um, in their best interests. Yeah. The other issue is gangs. Um, so uh, in a small place, there's no hiding. Yeah, you can't um, relocate someone um, where the gang won't know about them. Um, and these are drug gangs. These are gangs that have provided children with drugs um, in order to entice them in the gang. When a child or an adult goes into prison, the gang looks after their family. In other words, you're indebted to the gang when you come out. Yeah? Getting out of a gang, getting away from it, means leaving the country. Yeah? Um, but don't go to Miami because that's the export route. So, yes, um, difficult. Some of the other jurisdictions that I've worked in um, uh, don't have any juvenile provision. Um, and one of the things that, um, secure provision that is, but that I feel um, uh, one impact I had is that the children were removed from 30 to a cell with a hole in the floor with no air conditioning at temperatures of up to 40 degrees C. Um, to an air-conditioned unit with a toilet. But when we wanted to put education facilities in and, um, and a library, the head of prison, <coughs> prisons said that um, they were in a hotel. What more did they want? Um, so uh, there, you know, these are challenges in trying to develop a system. Where do you start? So you can forgive me for feeling somewhat overwhelmed with all of that when I start trying to think about how do I design a system to support and help. And I then go back to basics. There is a United Nations compendium on all the standards and norms and guidelines that's expected. And it is a very good reference book when you're overwhelmed with everything because it takes you right back to the absolute basics of what it is are we trying to do here? Why are, what are the red lines that we don't go beyond? Yeah? So separation of children insecure. Yeah? The right to privacy. Yeah? Um, scope of discretion that actually you can, yeah, you can divert out the system. Yeah? Um, removal of status offences, looking at the age of criminal responsibility, um, which in um, most places uh, in their new legislation is now older than ours, so, you know, um, I'd say no more. Uh, um, the, the well-being of the child is, um, is of uh, utmost importance, um, and that it's not the gravity of defence, but the circumstances of the child that need to be decided. It's the needs and deeds bit. Yeah, OK, the deeds is one thing, but the needs and how you respond to them is, is far more important. Um, but that all requires um, uh, some things that um, may not be present. Multi-agency working is one of the things that I take from our system that I think we've done really well. Um, we may have uh, got too good at it, and people don't really realise that we're doing it anymore. Um, but um, uh, trying to explain to people that actually you need education and health and people to work together um, and the idea of importing services so that when the child goes out there's it's the same services um, is something I've been working very hard on. Um, the, but the main thing that I've had to realise is that I have to develop something that is extremely simple because this is not going to be used every day, it's not even going to be used every week. Yeah five sheets of A4 being five years worth of offending yet. Yeah? This has to be a simple system that people can remember, even if they haven't used it for a couple of months. Yeah? How do you divert a child? Yeah? Well, how do you set up the systems to divert children out of the system? Um, and how do you train people in a way that means they will remember this system um, in a few months' time? So it's a lot of getting alongside people, working with people, trying to understand their context, trying to make it meaningful for them, um, and trying to work with, as I say, some wonderful judges who don't want me to tie their hands. But as I say to them, your contract is for three years. Um, a lot of judges are brought in on contracts. You're there for three years, yeah? When you go, somebody else could come who could be, you know, not you. And, <laughs> One uh, place I went once and then I went back again, the magistrate had changed, the judge had changed, and um, it was dire. Um, so I've learnt my lesson now. I want to write it so that we take the best of the good judges so that in the future their hands are tied. Um, so, um, yeah, an interesting experience. Uh, 
experiences um, and um, slightly uh, different. Um, and just to say, these are places where youth crime is rising, yeah, um, uh, and poverty and um, uh, has a big impact on it, as does the status of the children. Um, children are not necessarily seen as citizens with rights. Um, uh, and that is something that um, you realize when you're in those situations how far we've changed. I started as a probation officer in the 1970s um, when we didn't have youth offending teams, we didn't have children's services, um, and probation officers work with children. And uh, the way our system has changed and developed, you know, it still has its faults and there's still things we can work on, but we do, as a system, need to give ourselves an enormous pat on the back for how it's changed in that time. Um, but um, uh, I, think, um, I, th I think other jurisdictions uh, have a lot to offer us as well, as we've heard. So um, I can leave it there. Is that all right? Happy to talk to people in the bar. <laughs> Thanks very much, Lucy. I found all three of those presentations to be fascinating and we've learned a lot. But now we've got about six or seven minutes um, for some questions um, to the speakers. So if I grab the mic, I'll try and encourage the first question and we can get the microphone down to you. So that's just there, third row on the right. Mick Cobb, is that working? Uh, Mick Coleman, Head of Bolton Youth Fending Service. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank Gerhard for confirming my stereotype of all Dutch people that you speak better English than I do. <laughs> Even making jokes in grummy accents. Um, I found it both um, uplifting, the presentations, but also depressing, I think. Um, I'm uh, approaching retirement, thank God. Um, We've opened our convention again, talking about custody. Uh, the whole this morning was all about custody and tinkering around the edges of it, frankly, rather than uh, what we do in the community when 98% of the young people we work with, we work with in the community. Um, any idiot could tell you that four-bedded units with 29 staff are going to be far more effective than the warehouses that we use. How, I suppose my question, this is a bit of a ramble, but my question is, how do we get the political will in England and Wales to raise the age of criminal responsibility mm -hmm. and do something about that, that uh, situation in custody that is absolutely like you have in Norway? And how do we get a minister? That, where's the political will, really? And how do we get that political will? And I don't expect you to answer it, really. <laughs> <laughs> but it's what I feel, rant. Hey, guys. <laughs> You're asking me <laughs> <laughs> if I have a solution for England and Wales now. Um, I, I, I can't answer that. I mean, we have, a, we have a, a different society. It's built up in a different way. Um, the, the, uh, I think uh, looking at it as a foreigner also in Norway, uh, I think the most magnific magnificent thing that they have done is that they they had this, this community, this society that was built on solidarity, necessarily, because they were all living together in small places. And, and, uh, and they had this, this whole culture with very strong unions, very strong organizations and stuff. And uh, then they, they struck oil in 1970, and they became filthy rich, and they, it didn't change their value system. And that is... I think the most magnificent accomplishment in uh, in Norway. Uh, in addition, uh, I have to say, you, you asked me how can you how can you create how can you uh, uh, achieve something like that in, in England. I think it's very difficult. Um, now I'm just speaking as a as a critical foreigner. Uh, if I compare your press to our press, uh, that's an incredible difference. The, the way uh, we have two tabloids in Norway, uh, and then I define tabloids as, as papers that are dependent on loose sales and not on subscriptions. And uh, they do not write about these kinds of things. It's not that they are positive, or, or, uh, or, but they're not negative either. And it's more or less this kind of policy is accepted in Norway. Uh, when we wrote our um, white paper, not the one that I mentioned on juveniles, but a general 
white paper on the development of, uh, of criminal, uh, correctional policy in Norway in 2008. It was treated in Parliament and it took 25 minutes. There was no discussion. Uh, correctional policy is never an issue during election time. Um, the, one of the tabloids is always positive in its editorials about new reforms in, in uh, the correctional services. And this influences the public opinion immensely and of course public opinion influences politicians immensely so i think we have a yeah oh, I, know. I saw you were looking at no the pressure. No pressure. <laughs> i think that's one of the reasons why we uh, why we ended up in this in this uh, situation and and again i have to uh, repeat this of course we have budget cuts as well and and, and uh, sometimes the oil price is going down and and it's not really good producing oil it's not good for the climate but but it it does help that we have a very well organized society with a very well organized social welfare network that almost nobody is left to himself in Norway. Great. Can I just very quickly yeah, very brief, with, with just um, a couple of things in Scotland. W one of the things that's happening, which I think it, it, you're experiencing too, is a decline of, of the print press and the, the lack of resources the media now has. Now, that's um, you can argue whether that's a good bad, or bad thing, and it's both, isn't it? But what it does is it gives you an opportunity um, to produce really high quality press releases about research, about good work, and actually have much more engagement in because they don't have the resources to change it, <laughs> you'll often find <laughs> your press releases being quoted word for word. Now, obviously that's not a good thing in a, in a broader context, but it does open up a, a range of doors, and I, I wonder how much, because it's certainly taken us a lot of work in Scotland for a community of people and, and a range of professionals that are involved in supporting children involved in offending, to have the confidence to go to the media, to engage in some of these debates because of some of the negative um, coverage. So obviously you can't control some of that broader context, but there is things you can do around ensuring that people get media training, around supporting um, people with that lived experience to also have media training, to tell some of their story, because that's where we found a lot of the power for change actually comes from, from those personal stories and testimonies. Great, thanks. I think we've got time for just one more question, and you had your hand up a second, yeah. Okay, over there. Oh, I think I think we've given up with the microphone. So if you could just stand up and project, that would be great. I think the microphone doesn't work. Let me tell. Uh, my name's Chris Carter Allen. Formerly a uh, yacht head of yacht services, uh, Yacht Services, and formerly deputy governor. And I work in the customer service. And my role is to deliver some of the uh, Charlie Taylor recommendations. One of the bits, one of the projects I'm working on is to do with professionalising the work. I'm interested in a uh, colleague, a uh, cousin from uh, Norway, the course, the course that you were talking about, uh, for your staff that you will get through a two-year course, mm -hmm. to a three-year course. Could you tell us something about that um, in terms of, number one, why are you moving from two years to three years? Is it um, a full-time course? Is it vocational? Um, uh, you know, just a bit more about that. The... Um the reason to expand it from two to three years is just that we feel the need that they need to learn more because uh, because of the, the work that they're going to do. Um, it, it's a two-year course now, and uh, almost a year of it is uh, also practice. So you are in a specific prison, uh, but these are specific prisons where you also receive your training. So it's a combination of theory and uh, and practice. And the rest of the uh, the period is uh, theory. We have a staff academy uh, located in uh, in uh, yeah, in Norway in Lillestrøm, and um, it has a, um, yeah it has a large staff of of teachers. We teach subjects uh, everything from psychology, sociology, law, um, of course uh, how to how to do prison work. So how to use keys and stuff. Uh, security, uh, dynamic security is very important, so how to establish relationships with the inmates uh, in order to create a form of security that is based on personal trust, uh, on, on a, a feeling of procedural justice that people get when they are in, uh, in prison. And uh, a large chunk, I have to say, also of the uh, curriculum is uh, ethics and human rights. So this, this is what um, the training in, in broadly outlined looks like. I hope that answers your, yeah. your question. Thank you. Thanks very much. I think now we're out of time. So if you join me again, once again, thanking our speakers. That's <laughs>